Yeah, thank you so much, Madam Chair. Um, I'm called Zavi Ansawagasane, and I'm here to present to you my thesis about medicines for children, policy provisions, perspectives, availability, and practices in Uganda. As kind of preamble, I want to say that I was provoked to undertake this work because of uh, experiences I had in the community drug use studies. And the main thing at that time was that uh, we are trying to educate the public on medicine use, having realized that there were problems. So we had interventions in some districts in Uganda, and one of the DMOs refused that we should not train unqualified drug providers. And he asked us, where is this written in the law? Secondly, as a parent, I've been intrigued by the fact that medication for children is very complicated. And as a parent, I've been struggling on how to provide medicines for children prescribed by doctors. At one time, uh, we discussed with the pediatrician when one of our children was not able to swallow the medicines. He was vomiting instantly as is anybody advanced with medicine. So the pediatrician said, well, the option is that we can give injections. And injections, I had learned that people should not ask for injections, but prefer, they should take tablets because tablets are better. And so that one become, became a very big issue in my heart. And I, I started trying to find out where to get funding for this kind of work to inquire why children are not provided sufficient support. And um, one of the things that I think is that when we talk about science, science itself cannot thrive without the things outside it. And this is, uh, I will demonstrate how this happens. Um, so, as time was going on and I was still intrigued by this problem, there came an offer. There came the Child Med Project, which was funded by Danida through Macquarie University and the University of Copenhagen. And this project had four components. One had to do with perspectives about health and medicines among the children with HIV. The other one had something to do with asthma and the respiratory tract infections. And the other one had to do some, something to do with uptake of preventive treatment for schistomiasis. And the other was appropriate medicines for children, analysis of relevant policies, which I took on as my challenge. Being a project, we had a time frame, and also the project was focused on certain key areas, which we were not kind of allowed to change. So, um, this question of children's medicine is important because many children die, and they would not be dying if they had access to, me to medicines that are appropriate for their age and weight. This is because children have difficulties in taking oral medications, and children need medicines to their age, body weight, and physical conditions. Because there are few formulations, tablets have to be broken down or crushed to meet the children's needs. And sometimes caregivers force children to score the medicine. And this is important because caregivers get irritated and they force the children to score the medicine, which has a long-standing implication on their psychology. So um, you can see in the picture there, um, Worldwide, this issue has not been ignored. So at the global level, there have been some initiatives which were introduced to address the question of children's needs. And uh, this included 
the integrated management of childhood illnesses, which was considered as the main approach for treating children in more than 100 low-income countries. And WHO continuously revised the guidelines to, uh, to introduce evidence-based medicines to achieve um, uh, more appropriate treatment. And it was expected that in low-income countries, the people in charge would automatically integrate the new medicines, which were in the form of child appropriate dosage formulations, uh, to, to take care of the new changes that are taking place at the global level. Um, you can see that on the map, East Africa is actually implements like 70 percent of the districts are implementing IMCI as a strategy of management of children illness. The other global initiative was the uh, Make Medicine Child Size campaign, and this will happen during the World Health Assembly in 2007, where a resolution of better medicine for children was. Um, introduced and they were uh, emphasizing the fact that children need appropriate dosage forms. They need medicine strengths which are commensurate to age. And in 2007, uh, they highlighted some of the key dosage formulations which included dispersible tablets, pellets, sprinkles, and granules. And also WHO continued to make a model list of medicines for children to cater for this kind of need. In 2011 and 2012, WHO, UNICEF, and the UNFPA issued a list of priority medicines for women and children. It was later revived and termed as life-saving priority medicines. So the, the size is important, and um, it's important not only for the volume, but also for the active ingredients in the medicine, which can be uh, very dangerous if children are not given appropriate size. And size means also that these medicines can easily be swallowed. So you can see on this, uh, we have these medicines which are kind of scored. The scoring means that you break them into equal halves or quarters. And therefore, if they are not broken into equal halves, there is naturalness in those and to cause more problem than solving them. And on the right hand side, we see that the medicines are syllabs which have been popular actually in the Ugandan context. Ah, uh, it's at that size. So this child, even if the watermelon is nice, the child cannot eat it because the way it is. So, and uh, the argument is that. One size cannot fit all. We cannot use adult medicine to treat children because they are not fit. So after the Make Medicine Child campaign, UNICEF and WHO pledged to continue to identify prices of medicines and the sources where they can get the essential medicine for children and provide this information to different countries. And they were also supposed to work in partnership to raise awareness and improve on information about this concept and also do some studies that would accelerate policy formulation and change. So um, in terms of issues that we are looking at is that children have the right to benefit from science and in so doing they need medicines which are appropriate for their age and weight and also we know that actually given the literature we have reviewed children have been therapeutic Orphans, because they are treated with medicine for adults. And yet, we know that children are not adults. They are not miniatures of adults, but people with different anatomical and physical characteristics which should be addressed and looked at in when we are making medicine for them. So, the WHO in the World Health Assembly advised countries to uh, include child size medicine, the essential medicine list and treatment guidelines. Uh, so you can see children don't like medicine and they, you know, they would be resist if they are out. So um, now, in Uganda, we know that under five children, about 18% of the total population, and therefore, it's a big force to look at. And, um, we know also that under five mortality in Uganda, 
was uh, in 2011 was 90 per thousand live births, and this has reduced to 69 in 2014, and um, it's still low compared to what uh, the global tar target of 15,000 per thousand is. So um, there were some studies which were done, conducted worldwide in India and Sri Lanka. And the economic, many pharmaceutical network also did a series of studies in, in Chad, uh, Kenya, and Uganda. And they found out actually that medicine for children were not available in the face based organizations. But the problem was that they did not go to the public health facilities. And um, the operational definition of what child friendly medicine was leaves a lot to desire because they included syrups as one of the key medicines that they were looking at. So, in terms of information gap, we find that actually nobody had looked at policy provision for medicine for children as an issue, and the availability, and also the knowledge and practices of health workers in terms of what they knew about prepaid dosage formulations for children, and also what explanations the stakeholders had about this problem. So, the main of objective of this uh, thesis is to examine the transition of the globally recommended child appropriate dosage formulations in the context of Uganda in terms of policy provision, in terms of st stakeholders' perspectives, in terms of availability and in terms of health workers' experiences. So we set out to examine the existing medicine policies and also to determine the availability and utilization of the WHO recommended life-saving medicines we set out to explore the experiences of health workers about uh, child appropriate dosage information. We set out to explore the stakeholders' views about uh, the feasibility and relevance of including child appropriate dosage information in Uganda. So um, we had this uh, kind of thinking theoretically, you know, that um, we need to examine the process and development and policy implementation related issues as recommended by experts in policy analysis. And also, we looked at the multi-dimensional aspect covering uh, aspects of cross-sectional exploratory and analytical and explanatory aspects of, of looking at the whole problem of children's medicine in Uganda. This is reflected in the four studies that we have shared, which included policy provisions, availability of better medicines, health workers' perspectives, and perspectives of stakeholders. So, um, in terms of theoretical background, WHO is supposed to provide uh, guidance on medication and uh, the technology and knowledge, and this is developed in WHO and transferred to low-income countries like Uganda. Secondly, uh, there are questions of how this knowledge is transferred, incepted, and also uh, used in the context of the country like Uganda. Some anthropologists uh, developed some kind of interesting concepts like translation, transfer, appropriation, and diffusion. And um, all those we looked at, but we now down to an overarching theory of translation, which was developed by Richard written back in 2012, and it talks about the fact that when knowledge moved from one setting to another, it changes, and therefore this is mandatory, because unless this knowledge is changed, then it will not be useful. So, translation would also include the processes of stabilization and also institutionalization within the local setting to make this knowledge more appear natural. So in this thesis, we focused on the circumstances under which the global packages are integrated in Uganda, in the Ugandan test. And also, we looked at the process of stabilization in the, context, in the concept of legitimization, reflected through policy provisions, guidelines, training of health workers, and the mechanism which includes support supervision. So um, there are other the supplementary theories which looked at, and they are mainly in green in the studies, studies three and four. And um, 
there are many about the discussions about policy transfer analysis and adoption. And uh, the main issues around this is the issue of context, the issue of time perspective, the issue of uh, policy implementation, and the issue of sustainability of interventions. So um, this is our conceptual framework. And on the right hand side, we have all these good things suggested at the global level, where WHO says, OK, you need better medicine for children, you need appropriate dosage formulation, you need evidence-based medicines, you need to revise IMCI guidelines from time to time. And our, our thinking is that these good things do not move easily like that, and they are accepted in the local setting. They have to go through some forms of transition, translation, through legitimization, through economization, through supply systems, and also knowledge provided, as well as some kind of resistance, because they will not be implemented as appropriate. On the right hand side, we expect that this translation we will be reflected in the policies, will be reflected in the procurement, will be reflected in the pres prescription practices and formulations that are left out or included. So the main research questions would, would included are better medicine for children taken care in the policy framework of Uganda. Uh, better, med uh, better medicine for children are they are they uh, um, what are the perceptions of the health workers and what explanations do the stakeholders have about the uh, medicine for children? So these are the f kind of overview of methods and I wanted to say that for policy analysis we, we did a document review which included looking at the essential documents in the government and somewhere found with implementing partners and also to have to visit uh, drug stores and health workers in the peripheral facilities in Uganda and in the Ginger district and then we also um, looked at the experiences of health workers and uh, to look at the how they felt about uh, implementing IMCI along with improved medicine for children and then um, Last year, we looked at the stakeholders' per perspectives and what they thought were the reasons why the medicine for children are not being provided. Uh, there were four publications, and these are all of them were published. Um, so, study one. It looked at child size medicine concept, and the question was policy provisions. Do we have better medicine taken care of in the current policies? It was published, and um, before we go into details, I, will, I, will, I want to highlight a few issues about policy. And policy is, is very important because without policy, much of what is being done would not be done. So some different people have def defined it differently. Some have said it's, you know, principles government provides to provide services. Others have looked at it as formal authorization. Others have looked at it as a course of action that affects institutions and organizations. Others have, uh, we have looked at it as including policy statements, strategies, list of essential medicines and the clinical guidelines. So there is this concept of evidence-based medicine, and many people caution me that it's, it's really a danger zone, but I think it's important for us to highlight it in this case, because it's what we need for improvement of management of childhood illnesses. And uh, it, if we take Dickerson et al, they, they define that as a healthcare practice that's based on integrating knowledge gained from the best available such evidence, clinical experience, and also patients' values and circumstances. And I would like to highlight the last one, the last two, because it's, they are largely ignored. Because, you know, in Uganda, as we shall see later, clinicians have experience, and they feel that what experience they have 
they should use that instead of bringing new ideas. Um, the concept of child size, this means that medicine should be commensurate to age and size of the child, and there should be formulations that are easy for the child to swallow. So, we did some document review, and uh, documents were obtained from Minister of Health Archives, and we used the five tracer conditions with different implications and, uh, of treatment. For example, malaria and pneumonia, diarrhea, they are common illnesses that affect children in Uganda. And therefore, we felt that actually we would want to look at how they are provided for in the medicines formulations in the country. We looked at epilepsy and asthma because they are chronic conditions. Therefore, they have a different uh, way of looking at them because they are long-term illnesses and there is a way it affects uh, provisions. And then uh, we also looked at schistomiasis, which is a neglected tropical disease. And we mainly focused on oral medicines and um, uh, tablets and uh, we looked at powders, capsules, syrups, and also in inherent medicines and suppositories. So we used deductive content analysis based on the concepts derived from the literature review and also what WHO expects from the countries. And so those are some of the key terminologies that we tried to use to look at the documents to see whether they are reflected or not. So um, this, there is this concept of any classification which is also uh, going to be discussed from time to time along the way, and therefore it needs to be defined. And this was introduced in the 2012 of essential medicine and health supplies list of Uganda, and it specifies that we need to prioritize medicine for the sake of you know, avoiding wastage and because we are under-resourced. So um, they said vital medicines are those which are used to manage life-threatening conditions and therefore they must be available all the time. Essential medicines are those used to manage less severe but nevertheless widespread illnesses. They, they also necessary. But necessary medicines would be those which are not, uh, they, they have less impact on the population, but they may have high cost, but they have marginal therapeutic benefit. So, um, I also want to talk about this concept of legitimization because it's very important in this thesis from time to time we work across it. And legitimization actually is, it's interesting that I'm presenting this uh, at this time when people have been struggling with this question of the constitution and they are touching it, they are trying to amend it, they are, you know, people almost shed blood because the constitution was a problem. And so there were various interests and I wish the interests which were in the constitutional review or reform, reform but also looking at the needs of children. So legitimization is a process, is a process of adoption and adaptation, institutionalization of knowledge and practices. And in this study, we look at the development of guidelines. And this is the 2016 Uganda Clinical Guidelines, which um, were given. And it's important that if something is not in these guidelines, then the medical workers will not be able to apply it. So there are also issues of regulation, uh, safety, efficacy, and also they, they look at issues of uh, medicine being uh, accessible, cheap, and safe for use. So, we, so therefore we reviewed these policies to see the changes that were taking place in that case. And also, um, we want to say that some people argued that to legitimize children's medicine, you have to include them in the list. So uh, if they are not in the essential medicine list, then they are not legitimate. <coughs> so in this study, the main focus uh, was on provisions. And we found out that despite the the global interest in the child size medicines, 
There was no mention of this word in the policy documents of Uganda that we reviewed that time. Although there were provisions for medicine strength and they relied, they talked about tablets with this strength to be provided to children. And uh, I happened to look at this essential med uh, the clinical guidelines of 2016, which is the new version of what I reviewed in 2012 and 2010. It provides for weight. Actually, it's, it's one of the key introduction marks given in this, in this clinical guideline, meaning that actually the government attaches a lot of importance to strength because they don't want to give medicine which are, have a lot of active ingredients that would uh, be harmful to children. And also, uh, there is also an emphasis on evidence-based medicine, but there is inadequate provision for uh, a appropriate dosage formulations. And this is very important because this is where children have the biggest problem. So um, this is one of the tables that we, we, I wanted to share with you. And on one hand, we have tried appropriate dosage formulations, and we also look at whether these formulations are evidence-based medicine. So we looked at all those docu uh, different documents, and we, we tried to see what they provide. So uh, the, the, the pluses mean that it's provided, and the negatives mean it's not provided. For child appropriate dosage formulations, it was included um, in, in, in the clinical guidelines and uh, of 2010 and 2011, but for some medicines. Um, but when you look at the other key documents, for example, the health sector strategic plan, mentions nothing about providing medicine that are appropriate for children. Then also, um, the essential medicine and the health supplies list provided for child appropriate medicines, but not sufficiently. Um, when we looked at the Uganda clinical guidelines, there were some medicines that were not evidence-based. For example, by that time, the malaria treatment policy had changed to Artemetal mefantry and uh, in the guideline they were still talking about growing. Then also um, there was uh, provisions for evidence-based medicine in the essential medicine list because it provided for most of the drugs that are new in the in that time. So um, there are also medicine reforms we looked at, and uh, there were. We tried to see what reform it was and what were the key elements that they provided. And one of them were the clinical guidelines. Of course, they showed changes in the first treatment, uh, first treatment for pneumonia, first line treatment for pneumonia and malaria. But interestingly, the, health sub, the essential medicines and health supplies of Uganda included a component of health supplies and also venic classification. And venic classification as we defined it, meant a lot because if medicines for children are not classified as vital, then it will become a problem. But also, it, 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 the, the, some medicines were deleted, some formulations were deleted, the syrups were deleted. Which syrups were kind of uh, critical for management of childhood illnesses? There were no, um, there were no provisions for new medicines because the IMSA guidelines we reviewed we, we had not been revised since 2001. So um, we, we looked at some medicines for pneumonia and the other diseases to see whether they have appropriate strengths. And actually this element is addressed very well. Um, but when you come to child-friendly formulations, they are scattered here and there. You don't see many of them being reflected. Actually, I was even looking at these guidelines, and I found that actually, on, it's only among accessing, which is now being talked about uh, in this book as a dispersible tablet. But for malaria, for example, uh, a chemical from lumafentrin is still provided as a tablet, which is not uh, dispersible. 
Yeah, so um, the other thing we looked at is how are these medicines classified <coughs> and uh, according to vein classifications. And uh, well, the <coughs> medicines like amoxicillin, cotimaxazo, and artesanate were were not classified as as important, and then you have uh, also prasquantel, which is uh, for managing schistomyitis. Schistomyitis was actually not child friendly. So, um, but when it came to appropriate strengths. Most of the medicines which were classified as vital were in appropriate strengths for children. And uh, it's important that if the children were given appropriate medicines with appropriate strengths, then the idea of breaking tablets would not be arising in, in the future. So yes, Study two was looking at the availability and utilization of life saving priority medicine for children. And the main question was whether there are better medicine for children available and utilized. It was published and it was a processional survey of 32 Rowaribu Health Facilities. And uh, we looked at recommended priority me life saving medicines for diarrhea, sepsis, pneumonia, and malaria. We interviewed 81 health workers to ask them about utilization of these medicines. So it was a, a, a stratified one stage cluster design, and uh, we used probability proportional size uh, sampling, whereby if health facilities were more at that level, we would increase in, in that proportion. So this, um, we used. APIM4, which was exported, exported to SPSS, to do descriptive analysis, and we did it at university, at university level. And uh, we also uh, used it, we looked at availability as the number of WHO recommended priority life saving medicine that were available at the time of the visit and um, for the diseases specified utilization was calculated using reported medicines prescribed as percentage of the total treatment provided by the health workers so um, the findings indicate that um, for pneumonia the squad tablet was available Yeah, so, um, but for diarrhea, most of the health facilities had oral rehydration salts, but very few used them. And then that was also a similar pattern for zinc sulfate. Atemeta remefantrin uh, tablets we were not available. The dispersible tablets were not available, and this is very important because it it, it affects the access to child appropriate dose formulation. And even in these clinical guidelines, they are not highlighted as dispersible tablets. Yeah. So um, in study three. We explored health workers' knowledge and practices of formulations. And the research question was, what are the perceptions and practices of health workers regarding better medicine for children? It was also published, and uh, it was a qualitative study which covered Ministry of Health officials, district officials, and some f officials from the health facilities. We used the deductive content analysis based on Tanzera and Sonicroft framework. 
So the findings indicate that actually there was little funding for IMCI at the national district and facility levels. IMCI guidelines had not been revised, and decentralized IMCI activities were not implemented due to lack of resources. And the health workers pointed out the problem of lack of refresher training and, and revised guidelines. And the health workers faced challenges of treating children because children were not able to squat. The first study, the last one, was the one that had to do with transition to child appropriate just formulations, explaining it, how to explain why the children have not been provided with child appropriate dosage formulations. So it was also published and uh, it was also a qualitative uh, approach using 32 key informants and uh, we used uh, the deductive manifest and latent content analysis and also it was based on the theory and the global prescriptions of better medicine for children. So um, one, the results show that actually there was a failure of government to, to formally adopt child appropriate research formulation because of a source conference, but also there was a lack of consensus among the stakeholders about the appropriate dosage forms. There was also a challenge of leadership and coordination. So when we look at it in its entirety, the process actually of dissemination of the child size medicine concept or better medicine for children did not happen even at the global level. And in Kampara, it did not happen. And the Ministry of Health continued to anticipate that there would be some support of some sort from the Global Fund. At the level of knowledge, the child size medicine concept, of course, remained uh, unclear among the stakeholders. And it, it was explained the way people looked at it, using different uh, angles. The, some of them thought it was pediatric HIV. Others thought it was pediatric tablets. Others thought it was something similar to junior this, uh, aspirin. And in a stakeholder meeting, which we disseminated the results, it was really uh, clear that people did not understand it quite well. So um, this study showed actually that the child size medicine concept remained global and had not has not been disseminated at the level. And <coughs> during the stock, the um, we realized that actually there is a mismatch between the global and local <coughs> level. At the global, at the global level, they are clear on the dispersible tablets, sprinkles, and pellets to replace the ordinary tablets and syrups. But here, the syrups are being still uh, utilized and they are being prescribed by the workers. So there was this business of economics and, and science which we came across, and we think it's very important for us to discuss it right here, because most of the managers in health in the government felt that they needed to buy other tablets because they're economical. And they discouraged syrups or all dosage formulations because they're expensive and difficult to handle. They, they, they argued that the adults for medicines, the adult medicines were well established and familiar they knew the market, and child friendly formulations were not available. So the pediatricians whom we interviewed, on the other hand, argued that actually as syrups are easy to determine those, they are easy to administer to children, and breaking tablets affects what they called enteric coating, because if you break the child the medicine, it gets some ingredients spoiled before they are they reach the right place. So these are some of the uh, quotes we got from our respondents. Syrups are barake, they are costly, and syrups are more precise and created, calculated according to health workers. But we realized actually also that there was a question of leadership and coordination. There was no agency for knowledge brokering and Therefore, this 
discussion did not happen anyway, and there was lack of resources to engineer discussions by the key people who were involved. We also realized actually, much as there is legitimacy, much as there are rules and regulations, much as there are policies, there was some kind of statement about what legitimacy meant, because the essential medicine list, which is the legitimate document, did not provide for disposable tablets. And, but the donors were providing them. And also the other thing was that although government has deleted syrups for malaria and pneumonia, in the essential medicine list of 2012, health workers continued to prescribe them. And this meant that people had to go to the private clinics to buy the medicines. So um, in terms of discussion, um, we think that there is a relationship between policy provisions, context, and practices in relation to better medicine for children. We also know that we use the lot theory in terms of design and interpretation of the study finding, and they were very helpful. We also triangulated data cap using the four different studies, theoretical frameworks, and diversity of methods. The importance uh, of validation of the donor dominance question leaves a lot to that because we have the dual track arrangement and also issues of sustainability challenges, especially for IMSI, because IMSI could not be funded for the next phase, then they, they could not integrate the new medicine for children. There are also issues about uh, consensus uh, among the stakeholders, consensus about syrups and tablets. Although at the global level, more emphasis was put on dispersable medicines. The people here were only concerned about tablets and syrups. Uh, we think this study is important and in relation to children's medicines. And it's the first study of its kind. And the, the methods are pretty simple, and they can be replicated elsewhere. And it, we can contribute to the existing theories. Uh, there were some limitations, and we would like to highlight them. And simply because limitations are also a strength in some way or the other. And uh, for example, there was a question of age range. Uh, children are diverse. They can mean from 0 to 18 years. And therefore, we only focused for under five years of age. Theoretical frameworks were many, and uh, relevant analysis, but we had to select which one to use and which one not to use. Uh, the professional background, a social scientist, I had some people from pharma, pharmacy background and pediatricians. But uh, we also acknowledge that this study did not cover caregivers' perspectives. And I think we would recommend that this should be done if there's another opportunity. Uh, for the study on availability of, of medicine that the health facility, we did not do much various analysis uh, because we thought maybe it was what we wanted was availability and utilization. But I think it's one thing that we could look at in a postdoc arrangement. Um, in terms of conclusion, um, better medicine for children is still a piecemeal development, and we need to look at it to see which options are available. And also, the question of supportive policies, resource constraints, and the challenge of leadership are key in the way these medicines are evolving in the country. And uh, this explains why the syrups are still being highly emphasized by the pediatricians and also other health workers, but also the, uh, why there is limited availability and utilization. We, we conclude that IMCI is not robust enough to take on global initiatives, and we think it's important it has to take on global initiatives if it has to keep pace with evidence-based medicines and bring out 
uh, increase access to chat for the rural populations. In terms of theory, uh, Richard Rothenberg translation theory is good, but does not give enough uh, to explain what is happening in Uganda because of the context. And uh, for, in this case, we have donor-driven programs which are brought from the global level and imposed directly on the local setting without making changes as uh, Rottenberg would have wished. The complex system of different actors with different interests and who do not necessarily control each other. Also the question of knowledge dissemination and conservative stakeholders. Therefore, we recommend that an alternative theory to this is, is needed. I uh, would think that there is a need to revise the current policies and guidelines to reflect child size medicines. And we would also think that this should be regularly updated. And also, health workers must be trained. We need to up update stakeholders all the time and initiate policy advocacy for appropriate medicine for children. Uh, I would like to acknowledge these people who have been behind um, this work and uh, without them I would not be what I am doing now. Yeah. Thank you so much.